All right, I'd like to welcome you to this um, next session with a paper by Tom Flint. Um, the three of us standing up here are all um, students of Alplanica. We all wrote our dissertations with him. I imagine that uh, we all came to Notre Dame to study with Alplanica. Or this was, that was true for me. I don't know, Tom. All of us, yes. Okay, if not, they're going to say so because, you know. Uh, and I think that, uh, that Tom Flint and I were um, among the very first um, doctoral students uh, that Al Planiga had. Um, and I came here to study with Al even though at the time he was only teaching one course here a year driving down from Calvin College. But, um, you know, we just uh, went to evangelical school, Westmont College, and we read Al's work and pondered over it and beat our heads against the wall over it. And, um, and I just really want to study with this guy. And um, uh, Westmont was um, big rivals with Biola well, Biola University now, right? Mm -hmm. where, um, where our commentator is from. So maybe I'll say something about Tom Chris, first of all, uh, professor at Biola, um, graduate of Notre Dame, writing under Alvin Plantinga. And um, Tom has the distinction of um, having been at a lesser university, a lesser college than Westmont, uh, in the Southern California area. Our consolation at Westmont was that we weren't as conservative as Biola, especially on the dress code. So we would console ourselves by saying, at least we're not Biola. All right. So I just want, I just want Tom to know that, you know, you do have those issues, but that's okay. All right. Um, and now to uh, our speaker, Tom Flint. Uh, Tom and I, uh, I think, took, started um, Al's class on Bayes' theorem and probability in order to discuss the inductive argument from evil on the same day, um, we, which is a class in which I thought it was going to be fun, okay, because Al came in in his hiking boots, sleeves rolled up, you know, foot up on one of the chairs or whatever, and I thought, oh, this will be great. And then we started in. Um, I tried really hard to memorize Bayes' theorem because it kept coming up, but I didn't manage it. I never understood it. Um, and we would come in and Al would say, look, here's 45 star. It doesn't follow at all from 44 prime. In fact, it should have been 44 double prime. And then you get 45 star star. Now, why didn't any of you pick up on this? I'm counting on you. And we'd all go, you've got to be kidding. I mean, there's no way. So, um, you know, that was a pretty intense, that was a pretty intense introduction. But um, I think what we can tell from um, the comments so far and the atmosphere at this conference is that um, Al has the distinction, I think it's a very unusual one, of being a philosopher that's not only, who's not only greatly respected, uh, but greatly loved. And, um, and that's an unusual combination, I think, uh, particularly in academia, probably. Um, <clears throat> all right, and now about Tom, who's gonna present our paper on accidental necessity this, this morning. Um, as I've said, Tom and I came into that class on the same day, uh, he and I, received our doctorates on the same day. We got married on the same day, not to each other. <laughs> but, so I've been keeping a close watch on Tom's health. Um, <laughs> he looks good, so far so good. All right, so without further ado, uh, Thomas Flint. Well, thank you, Laura. Uh, I'm feeling fine so I far. <laughs> Um, it's really an honor to be part of this conference. I'm going to be speaking more about um, Al at the banquet tonight, so I'll save most of those comments for, that, for then. But this is truly a terrific event, um, and it's fully oh, yeah. fitting in a, and it's, can you hear? Yeah. And it's fully fitting and appropriate that we have such a terrific event for such a terrific philosopher and terrific person. If Alvin Plantinga hadn't unknowingly exhumed Molinism back in the 1970s, would anyone be freely discussing it today? <clears throat> God only knows. <clears throat> or so at least we Molinists are inclined to say. Whether or not we're right, the fact of the matter is that the theory of middle knowledge, very roughly the claim that God's providential governance of the world is guided by his knowledge of counterfactuals of creaturely freedom over which he has no control, uh, 
This theory remains a hotly debated topic on the contemporary philosophical scene. One element of that debate concerns how Molinists respond to a well-known type of argument for theological incompatibilism, that is, for the thesis that God's foreknowledge of a creature's action would be incompatible with that action's being free. Such arguments typically appear to be employing a kind of necessity, a kind that's come to be called accidental necessity. The relationship between Molinism and these discussions of accidental necessity, or AN for short, will be my focus in this talk. In a way, concentrating on arguments for theological incompatibilism is an odd use of one's time from the Molinist perspective. For Molinists, like many open theists of today, insist that foreknowledge has no real role to play in God's relationship to his world. God's decisions about what creatures to make and what situations to place them in, according to Molinists, are based on his middle knowledge plus his knowledge of necessary truths. Foreknowledge isn't action guiding. Once God knows that X will occur, he's no longer in a position to deliberate about whether or not to bring it about or at least to permit that X occur. Providentially speaking, foreknowledge is superfluous. Middle knowledge is where the action is when it's divine action we're contemplating. And if foreknowledge is superfluous, why divert one's energy into trying to defend it? The answer, of course, is that though irrelevant in one respect, divine foreknowledge isn't entirely irrelevant for the Molinist. True, foreknowledge has no role to play in God's creative act of will. But if God does possess middle knowledge, and if he decides on the basis of that knowledge to create certain free beings in certain situations, it logically follows that he knows what those beings will freely do. By itself, foreknowledge has nothing to do. But its absence would logically imply that God lacks middle knowledge. Hence, the success of an argument against divine foreknowledge would indirectly entail that the Molinist view collapses. It is for this reason, and only for this reason, that arguments for theological incompatibilism should be of some interest to the committed Molinist. It will prove helpful if we first look at a specific version of the common argument for theological incompatibilism, one that Molina offers us in Disputation 52 of his Concordia. Here's what he presents as the second of six arguments for the conclusion that God cannot know future contingents. Second, if a conditional is true and its antecedent is absolutely necessary, then its consequent is likewise absolutely necessary. Otherwise, in a valid consequence, the antecedent could be true and the consequent false which is in no way to be admitted. But the conditional, if God knew that this was going to be, then it will so happen, is true, or else God's knowledge would be false. And the antecedent is absolutely necessary, both because it is eternal and because it is past tense and there is no power over the past. Therefore, the consequent will be absolutely necessary as well, and hence no future thing foreknown by God will be contingent. To see more clearly the point of the argument, which I'll henceforth call simply the argument, let's employ an example. Suppose there were some true future contingent, say Cuthbert will freely buy an iguana at time t in the future. Let c stand for this proposition. Traditionally, theists are strongly inclined to say that God foreknows and has always foreknown C. Let's introduce a couple of operators here. So PX will be, it was the case that X, KX, God knows that X. So the traditionalist wants to affirm one, P, K, C. It was the case that God knows that Cuthbert will freely buy an iguana. Now, what God knows, indeed what he believes, can't be mistaken. It's not possible that he knows something and that something not be true. So, two, PKC 
entails C. I should note that uh, there should be actually a double line arrow. The uh, symbol didn't come through apparently when I uh, emailed this paper. And so the, I think there's a line 